Hello there. Welcome once again to Ginger the Voice. Uh, it's a Wednesday evening and we're back to our usual seven o'clock. I'm sure you're clapping hands for that because some of you were complaining that eight o'clock is way too late for you. So we're here back today uh, to talk to you. It's uh, HIV and AIDS Month Awareness. So we're here knocking at your door. If you are with us, can you kindly like our video or can you just jot down a hello, a wave to us so that we know that you are with us and we can start our program for the day. Ginger from Ginger the Voice, uh, welcomes you to tonight's topic that is very, very uh, interesting, quite a, uh, a topic that's, um, that needs more attention, even though it's been uh, around for quite some time. But uh, we will talk about it today. If you are here and are listening to us tonight, kindly like our video or wave to us uh, so that we know that we're not alone. We have you yeah. with us tonight. Ginger The Voice welcomes you to another episode, which by the way is the second last episode for this year. Thank you so much. We can see you liking our video. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, we are here. We are here with you. Thank you. We see you, Tammy. We see you, Bisumeba. Thank you so much for liking our program. Therefore, we will not waste time because today we have exactly an hour to go. My name is Ginger and I'm the founder of Ginger The Voice. We're an organization that seeks to give courage, hope and enlightenment to people. So we do this through various platforms such as talk shows, singing, speaking and singing. So tonight we are talking about uh, living your best life, living your best life with Criselda Kananda. I'm sure we all know, know her. She is in a, uh, an, a human rights activist. In fact, for me, she's more of a wellness promoter. That's what I can say. I've been following her on her Instagram quite a lot, and I've been seeing a lot of progress and, and, and um, progression in her life, and I'm grateful to have her on the program. Uh, Chriselda, thank you so much for coming through. Thank you for taking your time. Thank you for making space for Ginger The Voice and the listeners and followers of Ginger The Voice. Today, we welcome you on Ginger The Voice. Uh, so this is a day where we, you and I are going to hold a conversation. Yeah. Just a brief in introduction of who Chriselda is. I know that she's a well-known figure. She needs no introduction, but for the sake of observing protocol, uh, she's an author. She's a broadcaster. She's also a businesswoman. I know that she's a, a group exec on 360 Herbal Health. She's also an inspirational speaker. Uh, she's a promoter for wellness, as I say, and a, a civil rights activist. Chriselda, thank you so much for coming through. We welcome you tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've always had good stories about this ginger person and the ginger <laughs> platform and always wanted to be on the platform. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am humbled. Thank you, Marie Criselda. Criselda, um, first of all, I know that we do know you, you're a public figure, but it would be nice for us to take a bit of a recap. Who is Criselda? Where does she come from? Just a brief, brief background of who you are. You did say that we only have an hour, right? And yeah. I feel like I've lived a um, hundred years to get to where I am now. Um, but this is a young girl who was born um, in Boxbeck, Benoni, and went to five different township schools um, mm -hmm. because uh, of, of circumstances. My parents had gotten divorced and... Mm -hmm. um, the unfortunate reality when that happens, you'll be transported to the mother's side, your paternal family, your maternal family. Um, mm -hmm. So very unstable growing up environment. Um, that led me to being a teen mom. Uh, but I look back today, I, I mean, the achievements, not only do they affirm that anything is possible for anybody listening to this conversation, your background does not define who you are. Um, you actually get to uh, figure your, your description and, and you live that. Um, invest everything in your power to perfect that description. My description, simply put, I said to myself um, that I'm God's favorite daughter. So everything I do um, revolves around showcasing and showing off um, what God does in people's lives. I know that in media, we shy away from people who proclaim their spirituality. Yeah, um, but yeah. for me, there's no Chrysalda without God. I've seen miracles happen in my life. And um, in short, that's who Chrysalda is. And, and partly some of the things you had already mentioned in your introduction. 
Okay. All right. Uh, it's it's World AIDS Day. Well, that was yesterday, but it's also yeah. uh, 16 days of activism, you know. So I want to understand from you, what does World AIDS Day mean to you as Chris Elder? For me, it's, it's tragic um, because it's a day that is meant for us to reflect on how far we've come. Uh, what are some of the programs that are there um, that help us to minimize the continued numbers of people who are continuously becoming infected? Um, but we use the World AIDS Day um, as a celebration, as, as eventing uh, and, and less education. I mean, I'm, I'm watching with horror the conversation that's currently going on um, right here on Facebook about how I lied about my HIV status. So mm. for me, that then means um, there are people who still believe that you can't be beautiful, successful and progressive and be HIV positive. And that's tragic because people like those are the ones who then spread stigma. Um, mm. So for me, it should be a day when we begin to reflect um, that the 45 million people that we have lost to date, those were not just global numbers. Those were human beings, uh, human beings with dreams. Um, if, if we can begin to remember them by name, um, because when you put a face to a number, it's much easier to actually recognize that this is a human tragedy. And that is going to begin to help us personalize the risk of HIV infection, that it's not just about helping those people, but um, it is in connecting the eye to the risk um, that is involved with HIV. Because we, we have sayings like you either infected or affected, um, but we have not quantified what that means. If you claim to have been affected, you will show a bit of compassion to people who, who know their status and you will acknowledge that it's not the easiest thing to be telling people that I have a sexually transmitted infection. Um, so for me, it should be a day when we reflect on the personal risk and what our contribution is. And as you rightfully indicated that I'm an advocate of wellness and well-being, that we change the acronym HIV, leave the human immune virus um, uh, science speak to scientists, but you and I turn it into hope is vital turn it into health is vital and we move from acquired immune deficiency syndrome um, and, and leave the acronyms uh, to you know, science and, and you and I turn it to am I doing something and am I doing something about poverty in my in my mess uh, am I doing something about educating and informing where possible am I doing uh, something about knowing my status when we begin to shift the conversation to that uh, for me I truly believe that it will be a, a an awareness space well well done as opposed to what we're currently doing in eventing Okay, well, I want to understand you, you're talking about um, you obviously um, also being um, infected by HIV I, and you talk about the stigma just now. I want to understand from you, how did you cope and come to terms with the, the HIV stigma? One of the things I did consciously, I mean, coming from a nursing background and medical underwriting background, I decided those many years ago, it's almost 23 years now, I decided then that I was not going to be a victim. Um, victim of um, other people's ignorance, uh, victim of uh, level of understanding, whether it's um, a level that is informed by facts or ignorance, I'm not going to reduce myself to that. And therefore, most of the situations I find myself in, I don't regard them as um, as, as stigma, but I see them as teaching moments. When okay. I hear you oh, falter, um, I see that as an opportunity for me to teach so that you know better, because when people know better, they do better. Um, mm -hmm. I know that one of my biggest struggles, having been in media um, almost two decades, uh, mm -hmm. actually more than two decades, because I started far back at Kaya FM, um, you would have people uh, introducing um, Ginger as Ginger, the media personality, and Chrysalda, the AIDS activist. And mm -hmm. I have had to 
I mean, fight tooth and nail to say, when you are an activist of something, you are activating it. So how am I activating AIDS? Because when I'm about wellness, it's more a, a human rights activism as opposed to activating AIDS. And why am I different from my media colleagues? Um, just because I know my status. Okay, all right, I, I see. Okay, so when you found out, how were you able to tell your family and how did you go about telling your family? I know maybe there are a few people out there who are who already know their status, but it's very difficult for them to sit down and tell their family. They're scared of the reaction and how they see themselves afterwards. Yeah. How did you go about, maybe you can help someone listening tonight. I think for me to better help someone listening, let's talk about the reasons for disclosure. Because when we use my template, I was a rebel from the day I, I was diagnosed because okay. I refused to be a victim. And yeah. um, I, I, I'm, I don't subscribe to the notion of having disclosure ceremonies. We don't do this with hypertension. We don't do this with diabetes. Um, people's statuses are left to them to figure out what they need. But when it's HIV, we almost force people to tell us, um, you know, uh, their, their, our status. And we get to a place where we further ask. So when you look back, where did you get it from? Like there is a test anywhere in the world that can help you, you know, know. And there is no test in the world that can help you know where you contracted HIV from. It's a human immune deficiency causing virus. And uh, when we connect to that fact, we take away from sexualizing it. So for a person who's just recently been diagnosed, when you feel like you need to tell your mother, ask yourself these questions. What is it that I need from my mother um, for them to know my status? Because uh, it has to be, there must be a benefit attached to your disclosure. Don't do it um, just because you want support. Um, if you want support, rather seek professional support because you can't control how people respond to you sharing your status. If I tell you that I'm HIV positive and you stigmatize and discriminate due to ignorance, I can't control that. Um, but I can control uh, how I receive what it is that you say about me and how you treat me. And, and, and therefore, in investing more in understanding what is meant by being HIV positive, for me, is of better value than, you know, coming up with these disclosure ceremonies. Unless you've left your status um, quite late, where you now have an immune system that, um, you know, uh, prevents you from living. Um, and, and therefore, you are going to need support from specific individuals. And as you disclose, indicate to them what it is that you need help with. Let's not use being HIV positive as a tool in the workplace where you don't perform your duties when they want to medically board you, then only you disclose. Or being promiscuous um, when people confront you, uh, then only you use HIV as your excuse. Uh, it, it really doesn't serve the purpose. Um, rather, ensure that in your disclosure, uh, disclosure you disclose simply because uh, there's something you need from that individual and articulate it. Let, let's really um, also, as family members, move away from this notion of. But this person, we can see they have HIV, but they're not talking. And then when you ask them if they were to tell you as you right now, what is it that you would do? And they would say, but I can help. Why don't you help without knowing their status? Why does their status have, why should it be a determining factor on when a person needs help for you to just give the help? Okay, uh, you know, uh, you, you've, you've also mentioned this about promiscuity, promiscuity that's um, associated with being infected with HIV AIDS. How can we change this perception? Because it seems to be the, the most glaring perception out there. You know, yeah. once you declare this HIV, ah, oh, no, tandamato, tandamato. Once you this is HIV, it. Ah, no, tandamato, How can we uh, help eradicate this perception? We, we go back to facts. Um, scientists said HIV is a viral infection that causes immune deficiency. Um, you and I come from environments where 
we redefined um, HIV infection and called it Gaulayo, Pamukati, Z3, um, all these war metaphors and that are associated with promiscuity and wrong sexual practices. And, and it was for me, from where I stand, this was by design to scare us knowing that um, sex is taboo in many communities. And, and therefore it would deter people from seeking help. And the more people who are infected and are scared of talking about um, the, the uh, sexual decisions, or reproductive decisions. Uh, the unfortunate reality is we lose those people um, to the fear that is associated with being HIV positive. I do the talks that I do, I continue to share about my life and my experiences for people to actually realize that it was not a lie when scientists said there's a, a viral infection that causes immune deficiency. Therefore, we need to learn to invest in strengthening the immune system, the how we have not even started um, mm. talking about it. Our uh, investment is more in ulele nobani and nyam kumbula, even uh, upon my death. Um, the, the conversations will be around, um, she was also dating so-and-so, she got married to so-and-so. Um, the conversations are just so highly sexualized. Your question is, how do we move away from this? Stop sexualizing mm -hmm. HIV. I mean, even when you go back to um, the ABCs, it was about abstinence. It was um, A, B, going to be, be faithful. It was about sex. Um, Lucy was for condoms. It was about sex. Where is the teaching about wellness and how your immune system functions in that? Um, because when you are tested diabetic, You'll be told about the implications of, um, you know, eating sweets and reducing intake of, of glucose in your system because this is how your system breaks down glucose. But we didn't do that with HIV. It was so highly sexualized um, and, and bad sex education, if you ask me. Uh, we need to go back and revise the teachings, look at what the virus does. It's an immune a deficiency causing virus and therefore invest more information on what does it take to strengthen the immune system and it takes body mind and soul you look at um, our interventions right now all of them are now resources are only focused on give people ARVs where are the psychologists uh, to yep. deal with mental Thank health you. issues uh, where are the social the, the um, social workers to deal with uh, poverty stricken uh, human beings uh, because every medication says before after meals, there is a meal somewhere, whether you take it before or after. When are we going to begin to address those realities, those issues? Um, because there's, uh, we've created a notion that you pop a pill, all your problems go away. You still mm. will be dumped when you are HIV positive. Emotionally, yeah. how does that impact on your ability to produce cells that are going to help you fight against disease-causing agents? Wow, wow. Uh, you know, I, I do know that you were six months pregnant or seven months pregnant when you, seven, when you found yeah. out, seven months pregnant when you found out about your HIV status. Can you take us through that? Why did you, what led you to go test in the first place? And what was going on in your mind? Can you just give us a brief of that story? What was happening? Yeah, so the previous year I, I had miscarried and my doctor and I could not figure out what had happened. Uh, we tried everything in our power to just assess that you are healthy, you live in an affluent suburb, what could have gone wrong? Um, and I, I had had uh, two children already. Uh, miscarriage was the first experience. Uh, and I jokingly, uh, at seven months pregnant, when doctor was doing routine tests, jokingly, I say to him, why don't you include HIV as well? Um, because, you know, you never know. And both of us actually laughed um, at that moment. And he followed on by saying, uh, why have you been naughty? And, and that's part of the stigma that you, um, we self-stigmatize and some healthcare professionals in the words they use also put you in, in a box. Because um, mm. I, I then walk away as this person who's done something wrong, who's done something naughty. 
when he knew my family, um, he's, he had been my, my gynae for a while. Um, so we laugh about it and I walk away. Two weeks later, he calls and he says, I've got good news and bad news. Good news is that all your other tests are perfectly normal. You and the baby are doing so well, it's phenomenal. And then I wanted to know what could be so bad then, because I mean, we've passed the first trimester, uh, which I did not even reach the previous year. So what could be wrong? And then he says, unfortunately, to use his words, because people don't understand why I'm so passionate about separating HIV infection from having AIDS, because it's a different, um, we, we don't say hypertension stroke. Um, hypertension stroke becomes a consequence of not taking care of your hypertensive state. So with HIV, why is it acceptable to just say HIV AIDS? Um, because they're not the same thing. Um, so, and, and I walked away from those rooms believing that I'm going to die. Uh, and, and the more I read about HIV, everything was confirming that you are going to die and it's going to happen soon. Then he said, drive to my rooms, let's talk about your options. And I get to his rooms. Uh, one of my options was that I'll help you abort the baby. And, um, and, and I, when I asked how long I had to live, uh, he said two years because I had discovered whilst I was still healthy. So what I then did every year when it was my daughter's birthday, because I since took nevilapine because I read and, and um, discovered that I can take medication that will prevent mother to child transmission. There are certain things that I can do um, to ensure that I give birth uh, to a baby that doesn't have HIV. So I took the nevilapine six hours before delivery and gave birth to a beautiful bouncy baby daughter, which just gave me renewed hope. Um, obviously, I had a cesarean section, taking all the precautions to minimize the contact with my blood um, for the baby. And I walked away uh, from those rooms seeking clarity. When I say I'm God's favorite daughter, it's not a myth. And, and it was interesting that as I ask questions, there'll be someone who teaches me something I didn't know. And this is why I'm so passionate about people moving away from this fear and the ignorance and focus on facts. Because I gave birth to a baby daughter who's almost um, 23 now, who is a graduate who does not have HIV. Oh, and true. I continue to live um, in total wellness and well being. Mm -hmm. and, and simply because I just, did what I needed to do. When you are told of your status, then find out, uh, assess your challenges. I remember when I was told, I mean, I was so devastated that the first person I called was my then partner. I wanted to know where did this come from? Because we were socialized that somebody is to blame. So mm. I told him that let's meet at home. My plan was to get there, cook the best meal, and when he's full and, and, and he falls asleep, I know the key coordinates for the um, safe. I will reach out for a gun, <laughs> for gun. and end this deed for all of us. Oh, and, wow. and thank goodness that I regained my sanity. Natural fact, radio saved my life um, because I wanted to just regain my sanity. So I switched on, and on, on the radio and on the day, um, the topic was women who are in prison for killing their husbands. Mm. So how's that for an instant answer from God that yeah. Nagel, I not tell you, sense. that's not what you want to do. Trust me. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, no, it shifted my thinking. I began mm. to invest in learning about HIV, getting information, um, empowering myself with knowledge. And the knowledge gave me power. And the rest is history, as they say. I guess what I take from you in this conversation is that it's important to educate ourselves whether you're infected or affected by Absolutely. HIV. Absolutely. Because it could be your best friend calling you and saying I'm HIV positive. Yes. Uh, you can't call Criselda all the time. Yes. My best friend just disclosed. And when you begin to ask, did your girl or best friend give you permission to disclose to me? No, mm, but I trust mm. that you won't disclose. <laughs> so I'm also human. And people suffer from what I call selsy moments where you just want to tell somebody. And, and, and that is what has created this drama that we see in our mess. And it's totally unnecessary. If we are informed, you personalize the risk, you know 
facts about HIV for yourself, not to help those people. Uh, it changes how you view it. It changes the dynamics altogether. You're talking about disclosure at the moment. And what I've heard around um, on social media that in actual fact, the person with you are in a partnership or in a marriage or relationship, um, it is not the responsibility of the carrier of HIV to tell you. It's yeah. you, the other person who needs to ask. How, how fair is that? And what's your, what's your take on that? I, I truly believe that um, the responsibility lies with all of us um, because your health is your responsibility, not your partners so when you meet up with someone you don't know it is your responsibility to insist on protection um, because you will be exposed to things that this person is carrying and and if you don't take the responsibility of protecting yourself you can then blame the other person and say but you infected me where were you when you became infected um it's one of the uh, healing things that our decisions that I made the many years ago when I was extremely disappointed and angry that this man infected me. Um, I have had to go back and ask, why didn't I ask about his status? Because I did not ask. And, and it was my responsibility to look after my health. Uh, because I didn't ask, I take the responsibility that I did expose myself to HIV and therefore now I have HIV. Okay. Um, when, when you get involved in a car accident and yeah. uh, due to your recklessness, you don't go and sue the manufacturer of the car. Mm -hmm. You take mm -hmm. responsibility. You made an, a mistake. You add. Okay. And so what would you say about that in a marriage situation where the partner has, um, you know, infidelity comes in here and there in a marriage situation? Is it now the responsibility of the one who stayed at home and kept to the vows to, to ask <laughs> or is the partner who went out to do whatever it is that is wrong, is it their responsibility to come back and say, you know what, I found that I'm HIV positive? In an ideal um, situation or environment, we would love for people to come and be truthful and tell us the truth. But you and I know that uh, human nature, when you know that you have put someone at risk, we don't come back and own up um, to, to having made wrong decisions. Uh, that have led the family to uh, being diseased, uh, so to speak. So I still say when once you've discovered that your partner is cheating, you both uh, you insist on going for tests, and if you are negative, you take the responsibility of choosing to stay, um, because once a cheater, always a cheater. It's a fact, and once you've figured that your person is a cheater and you choose to stay, uh, be ready for the consequences. Okay. All right, you were, you were recently hospitalized um, and thank God that you came out and uh, you were COVID negative. Um, what happened? Can you just take us through that? What happened and how did you feel at that moment knowing that if you have a pre-existing condition, you yeah. diabetes, cancer, HIV, you are then more, so the scientists and the doctors say, you're then more prone to being, you know, uh, not really making it through if you are infected by COVID. Yeah, so how, how, what is going on through your mind? How did you yeah. feel about this whole thing? Look, when my um, divorce of a two and a half year old marriage, which was highly publicized um, and, and the, the feeling of disappointment. And when we done with this conversation, uh, please Google my wedding. It was one of the best days ever. It was so beautiful. And mm -hmm. I saw how genuine my partner is. And for me, to experience something that I've been teaching about. And mm. to, when you begin to live the moments, you actually mm. realize that signs were there, but I chose to look the other way. Um, mm. and, and the consequence of that was when we got to a place where he physically violated me, when premarital counseling, we were asked, what would be a deal breaker for you? For him, it was um, cheating, that if I were to cheat, he walks. And I knew that and I understood it. And for me, it was uh, physical abuse because okay. I come from an environment where my grandmother um, was abused by my grandfather and she committed suicide. Mm -hmm. My mother was abused by my father and um, she became an alcoholic. 
and I was not going to be a third generation that okays this um, because mm. it's a message I'm sending for my daughters. I, mm. I gave birth to baby daughters that I would not want um, to take this as our legacy. So I have had to make a, a selfish decision that chose me, no matter how sorry he felt, I did not want, because one of the shocking things for me was when I asked, why did you do this? And he said, I don't know. Uh, that, that for me said, are you going to stick around and figure out what else he will do and not know? And, and the answer was simply no. So mm -hmm. walking away from that, not only was it hurtful, but it, it extremely suppressed my immune system. Um, and this is what I've always been teaching that uh, using CD4 counts uh, to determine when people start ARVs is a long measure because your CD4 count fluctuates with your emotional state. When mm -hmm. I, I tell you that you've just won 50 million lotto, your CD4 counts replicate at a speed of lightning. And if I were to tell you that your loved one has just died, um, your immune system will be low. And this is why we would need encouragement, we would need um, some of us who are girly girly, would go to a spa, because you need um, some soul uh, feeling, soul connection. Um, so, so my immune system got to the lowest it's ever been, no matter how much I tried um, to self-talk and uh, the reality was I, I have to walk away from the families that I had established. He has children that I, I had grown to love. Uh, there was so much that I was walking away from and it mm -hmm. was a painful process. And yeah. on top of that, to, to have me, uh, social media texts of people who did not even understand my circumstances uh, when I chose to have him be canceled and rehabilitated and jailed, because I truly believe that imprisonment is not, um, is not going to fix our social ills because pe people behave the way they do because of how they are socialized, how they are raised, and all those um, things have to be taken into consideration when we make decisions. Uh, prison is not going to simply take away how people have been socialized all their lives. And, and it's not teaching uh, and it's not rehabilitative. In fact, most of these men, when they come out of prison, they come out seeking vengeance. Um, so we, we're, not, we're not achieving anything by just throwing them into jail. Um, we need I to think, rehabilitate I think, them. I think what 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 was the biggest thing to 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 your audience or to your followers was that you dropped the charges when yeah. um you we we know you as a voice for women. We know you as an yeah. advocate for for healthy relationships. I mean, you are part of you featured in one of um Musa uh, Wenene's um um we are Tandwa. There's a there's a storyline that you have that you featured in. You know, promoting healthy relationships. So I think that's where the the audience and your followers were at. How can you drop the charges when this man has done this to you? But the sad reality is they were not interested in my response to how can. Because it's all good and well for the accusation based on what you believe you know. But then give me an opportunity to explain to you why I did that. And I still say, this man, I met him, he's a breadwinner of three families. He has five children that he's supporting, he's putting in school. Um, so me wanting selfishly, because him going to prison is not going to change the fact that he's an abuser. Um, it, it's not going to change the fact that he harmed me. So me choosing to be in that relationship, uh, for me, that's more betrayal. But me saying, um, your nature as you are, I don't want to be with you, but I don't want to be the reason why your daughter can't have school fees um, because you violated me. So I'm taking myself out of you and your mess. You go and sort yourself out, whether you go for counseling, whether you go for rehabilitation, wh whatever means you choose, I will not be part of that. For me, betrayal would have been me staying in an environment like that um, because okay. those three families must now be put into poverty because I just wanted vengeance. 
Um, I, I strongly advocate for uh, forgiveness and forgiveness is whole. Forgiveness is not only for the perpetrator, but forgiveness is for your self-healing as well. In order for me to walk away healed, I needed to consider um, you know, giving him a chance to fix himself without me. Uh, and that for me was um, a decision that I had to make. Uh, because I know what it's like to grow up without a parent that takes care of you. So I was not going to be that reason for his baby daughter, for his baby son. It was not my place. But I knew that I don't want to be part of that union. He will have a criminal record and um, he will not be able to work for his family. So you I know a bigger picture. Well, I know you some people will say he should have thought of that before he violated me. Nobody wakes up in the morning and say, I'm going to go around beating up women. Most okay, of so these men are not on well. You, on your side, on your side, Griselda, you were looking at the bigger picture. Absolutely. I, I was putting the hat of an activist because when you say that you are a human rights activist, all humans within your activism have rights. Okay. No, I understand your story and I hope your followers and listeners, listeners are understanding that story now. Um, I want to come to, to one question. You are an author as well. You wrote a book called You Are Never Alone. What inspired that title and what's the book all about? And I look at um, all the experiences I've had from being a teen mom um, to having mothers in, in my community helping me to raise my daughter um, to being a widow at only 24 years um, of age and, and having um, people around me that were reaching out to give love. Um, the book is about just looking at some of the family secrets that have eroded the family structure. And, and how we can deal with these uh, situations that just take away from how we do family as African people. Um, and and in, in getting whoever is going through whatever situation to know you are never alone. There are people reaching out, wanting to give you support, wanting to give you love, but most, mostly we focus so much and invest a lot in the pain and being victims than paying attention to people who actually are giving you a hand up um, so that you can get out of whatever messy situation. So in a way, the book encourages all of us to just reflect on what are the resources at my disposal with this challenge that I'm faced with right now? How can I get myself out of this situation? Um, because there's hope all the time. Um, it depends on where you're looking. Okay. And, and there's, there's a portion in the book that, that you wrote, it says um, something like everything that happens to you is as a result of, of the conversations conversations you have with yourselves. So yeah. what could, I want to take it down to those people who are HIV infected. What kind of conversations should they have so that they can have uh, results that are more positive in their lifestyle so that they can also yeah. get to a point, a level of thinking where like you are in now and able to, so that they can be able to achieve more like you have now. Yeah. The thing is, whatever you say about yourself, whatever you affirm as who you are, you are correct. If you are going to say I'm a failure, I am ugly, I, I, I do all things wrong, um, it, it, that is exactly how your life is going to turn out. Um, but if you self-affirm and you believe that you are worthy of good things and you believe that you are worthy of love, you believe that you are worthy of of um, it's just good things around you. Uh, they like, like attracts like. Um, so I, I truly believe that if we can deal more with the mind, it's such a tragedy in South Africa that uh, in our response to HIV, we don't, we have not invested um, in understanding the impact of our mental state when a person tells you, you have HIV. Many people that we've lost We've lost because they lock themselves in being a victim, uh, in not believing uh, that there is there would be better days, that time indeed does heal. So we need to get to or begin to talk about the impact of um, mental health in diagnosis. 
uh, because I, I mean, the payoff line for my company, Positive Talk Services, is it's all in the mind. Because I realized that once I fixed the things I was saying about myself, the things I was thinking about myself, it didn't matter what the next person was saying about me. Okay. So it's how you see yourself that's important and that yeah. matters. And what you say okay. about yourself. Okay, because your inner self is actually listening. I actually read, read a, a, a line from a, a, a book. Mm, mm. You are now teaching your inner self uh, yeah. how to think of yourself. All right. Yeah. Um, um, another thing and some of those as, things, as yourself, uh, sorry to cut you there, some of okay. those things are That's things, fine. are learned behaviors, are learned behaviors because we come from environments where our parents don't affirm us. Um, you'll find a child... Uh, who a school, the teachers will say you'll amount to nothing. You are useless. You are a failure. At home, they call all sorts of funny names. Um, and, and in Sesotho, we say, and, and that would mean that whatever you label me as, if I believe you, so it is. Okay. All right. Um, nowadays, we have we've seen that HIV and AIDS have been heavily commercialized, okay? We see ribbons, we see condoms, we see just that about it. What, what is it that we can do differently to really make a positive um, impact or a positive change? It's, it's very difficult um, because, I mean, you forgot t-shirts in your list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, whenever I'm invited to come and speak, I always tell them, no ribbons, no t-shirts, please. I am just, I have no space. Yes, I give these things away, but they keep piling up. It's ridiculous. For me, it's, it's more about just spending that money in providing people with factual details around HIV. Um, because when you're going to uh, create an event, and it, it's so unfortunate that many of these people who manage programs, Every year, they look for new faces. Every year, they new, look for new victims. There's no sustainability in the messaging. If Chrysalda came here 10 years ago and said it's possible to live, um, I'm not saying that I should be given repeat uh, businesses, but it only makes sense to sustain the message by saying the things that she was teaching about she's putting in practice. And when I come back the next time, show me within your organization, people who have implemented the things that we discussed and have now changed, um, that you don't always go and look for a Chrysalda. Create your own Chrysaldas within the organization that the next time you call her, she must come and see um, uh, the impact of her actions, the fruits of, of, of the, the labor that is associated with research and, and knowledge transfer. Um, and, and, you know, I truly believe that we're not spending as much time in, in creating knowledgeable people around the disease. We do eventing. Um, and like you said, highly, highly commercialized. Yeah. I still don't understand why is it that so many years later, we still don't have a vaccine. Did you see yeah. how quick um, people are going to be vaccinated now with COVID. COVID. If we are able to do it for COVID, why couldn't we do it for HIV? Mm -hmm. If if it is a viral infection. I hear you. Hello? I'm here. Okay, all right. No, you just went too, too quiet and I thought it was the next... <laughs> Right. Tell me, what are the biggest challenges that um, people living with HIV encounter and how can they overcome those challenges? As someone who's been um, in this situation for almost over 20 years, uh, what advice could you give them and, and how to overcome these challenges? One of the biggest challenges is the negative self-talk, the self-stigma, mm -hmm. um, the fear of the unknown. One of the questions I always ask when a person reaches out to me in panic, they would use words like, I follow you everywhere. I, I see, I read about everything you write. I just tested positive and I believe I'm going to die. And you're like, but like, really? 
when you follow me everywhere, you read everything I write. So that means for me, you are not internalizing and personalizing what you are reading. It's, mm -hmm. it's all about reading um, so I can see what is Chrysalda up to now. And that's yeah. why you would put out a, a piece that is aimed at teaching and the person then wants to critique it from a, a, an ignorance um, perspective. And, and I truly believe that uh, if we can just address how people view themselves when they are HIV infected, we would have won a great deal. Because currently people self-stigmatize, they put themselves in boxes. I mean, um, one of my favorite questions is, so what is the biggest fear? And the person would respond in saying, I'm going to die. Then I'd be like, but show me the one person who's not going to die. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it becomes a, uh, there's dead yeah. air. Yeah. Like yeah. all of us are going six feet under. The sooner you That's realize good. that, the better. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So and many I, of the things that are feared are really unfounded. And on, on the portion of, of death, I still have a question to Christians who believe that they're going to heaven once they die. Why are then they fearful? Why is this home called heaven such a fear? We all sing in church that we want to want to go home, but when death is upon us, somehow Christians get scared of that. That's another oh, topic absolutely. for another day. <laughs> it's a but topic I for wondering. another day. Yeah, no, don't get me started with Christians. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It really, I mean, Christians are driving people away from church. How so? And I say this boldly. I say this boldly um, because, you know, there's a pastor who came out and said Jesus Christ was HIV positive. That crucifixion, Ooh. Christians Ooh. wanted to almost murder him. How mm. dare you? And, mm. and this pastor is saying, uh, <laughs> if you are Christ-like as a human being, mm. when you test HIV positive, mm. who are you then? Does it mean when I'm HIV positive, I'm, I'm no longer Christ-like as a Christian because mm. I have HIV? Mm. It's double yeah. standards for me. And, and totally. people, yeah, no, it's totally double standards. And people have been crucified and they've been labeled, they've been ostracized because they test HIV positive. And if we can go back to those basics that it's a human immune deficiency causing virus, we'll actually realize that stigmatizing people and um, judging them it, it adds more in a depleted immune function. Absolutely. I think it would have been wonderful if we had a world where people were accepted for who they are and whatever yeah. illness they have, we, we give them support. We give support to people who, are, who are, have cancer. We give support to people who have um, um, diabetes and all these other sicknesses, which are actually well, with cancer HIV, and diabetes. You can die yeah. as soon as yesterday. It's, it's, it's the highest in, in, in the world. Um, with HIV, you can live for years and years. Talking about that, um, you are uh, living for years and years um, when it comes to HIV. Um, I read that in an article that you were saying that you've only recently started using ARVs by yeah. 2020. Yeah. How true is that? Yeah. Because when my immune system was depleted, I, I knew that if we have another viral infection, um, that I might be possibly exposed to, I needed to increase my chances of minimizing the viruses that enter my body. And, and for me, taking ARVs, because these are anti-HIV medicines, I, I still believe that amongst the three drugs, um, the combination of the three drugs, we might have one that um, is able to interact with, HIV, with, with COVID as well. Uh, but because uh, the investment is more on who's going to come up with this um, drug first or virus um, or, or vaccine first, we're not thinking. We've done extensive research on the three therapies that have been identified to kill viruses. So um, contrary to popular belief that I, I don't like ARVs, for me, it was more on when you take Panado, you take a Panado because you have a headache or pain that you want to treat. When you have an immune deficiency virus, um, when your immune system is not deficient yet, when you treat, what are you treating? 
So, so in this instance, my immune system for the first time got to as low as 0 0.093, which has never, I mean, I remember my doctor sitting with me and saying, I don't even know what to say to you. You know uh, these words better because people with your CD4 count are not breathing. I don't even know how you even sitting across me and we're discussing your treatment plan. Um, but it, it's a dire situation. And well, because you, you, that, sorry to cut you there, Chris, you did say that you are God's favorite da daughter. So I suppose this is it. the virtuism comes there. <laughs> this is it. And God exposes me to information um, that I need to then make informed decisions and choices. So, um, you know, I, I, I simply just made the choice so that I can increase my chances of surviving COVID infection, because I believe many of us have been infected and recovered without even knowing. Um, mm. Now developed an immune system or immune response that uh, is able to deal with this COVID virus. Um, and yeah, all the other commercialization is just so unfortunate. Uh, but I, I, I made that decision solely to um, just give my immune system a fighting chance. And it's been okay. incredible. Everything I've taught about, all the side effects that I read about, I have experienced them. Um, but you know, like um, science disclosed in the package inset, uh, all of them are not permanent. Uh, the, the beauty is in knowing that when I experience um, skin reactions, what do I do? When I experience fatigue, what do I do? And we have not invested education in all this. Okay. Um, um, one of our last questions is about to wrap up. Griselda, you, you have done marvelous work even after you have been diagnosed with HIV, which shows that there's life after the diagnosis. You don't need to sit down at home and fold your arms and think that the next thing is death. So just tell us there, and just by the way, congratulations on your honorary doctorate um, from the University of... Say it, say it, say it, say it. I want to hear you saying it. I am now... You're now Dr. Griselda Kananda. <laughs> So well done. Your work um, is, is quite um, um, amazing. Um, we see you doing a lot of work. We see you on from the media space and those who know you closely can see and attest to your work Thank that you've you. done of being a voice to, um, for women, being a voice and being a civil, a true civil rights activist. So um, you do deserve it. So congratulations on that. So what we want to know yeah. now as someone who has this HIV uh, virus, how did you get to be so positive? How did you get to a point where you told yourself that you are going to win, come what may? I mean, you do have, you've got kids, for instance. That's a, that alone is a responsibility. I'm sure, okay, in your marriage, that alone was a responsibility. It comes with a lot of challenges. How did you beat all these challenges? Uh, despite the situation that you're in, you still need to look after yourself and yet you're looking after a whole nation, looking after your own family, you know, and every other thing that you have to look at. How did you get to where you are? I invested in knowing who I am. I invested in knowing my strengths and weaknesses um, because that helps me to make decisions that are based on the person that I am. I know things that I'm capable of and I know things that I'm incapable of handling. Um, and I, that serenity prayer is, is my philosophy. I don't sweat small stuff. I don't try and force myself into situations and situations. <laughs> I, and I invest in loving me unconditionally before I can expect it from other people. Um, because uh, you, you, you can't give what you don't have. And, and that investment in loving myself, in, in acknowledging that when you say you are God's favorite daughter, what exactly does that mean? And when I unpack it in scripture, uh, anything and any challenge um, does not happen to me, but it happens for me. So I always look for the four, um, that in this situation, in this challenge, what lessons am I meant to learn? Um, because it's incredible how when you don't focus on the lesson, on the lesson that you are meant to learn with whatever challenge you're going through, it repeats itself. One of the um, things that I've had to invest in, I remember dating in relationships, I, I saw a pattern. I was always going for men with money so they can take care of me. 
because daddy, I did not have a daddy figure in my life mm. until I replaced that with the Abba father. Um, and, and you know, when I understood that my Abba father actually gives me an all access card um, with a pin code that gives me access everywhere. Um, that gave me a level of, uh, in a way, arrogance in knowing that I can achieve and be anything that I want to be. And all the spaces I've, I've occupied with humility, I, I continue to just um, stay of service. And it's incredible that when you serve as a mother, when you serve as a leader, when you serve as a, a, a citizen, um, the rewards are just insurmountable. Who knew? that a an, an D plus and F sometimes um, student could be called doctor today. Doctor. Only God knows those things. So when you connect to the purpose of why you are here, everything else around you just makes sense. Wow. You know, I, 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 I like what you just said now. Also thinking back of our new uh, musical artist, G65, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. She did not, her dreams, she decided that her dreams will be valid. She, she probably this is it. Had, yes. So that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the power we need to generate within us that we still, oh, for as long as you are breathing, you still, yeah. your dreams are still valid. Therefore, you need to work yeah. at it, give it all. And yeah, so thank you so much, Ben Criselda. Criselda, what are your last words to South Africans in particular, but to the entire world regarding HIV and AIDS? I mean, I continue. Um, for some people, I know that um, they would be asking, do you still believe in love after what you've gone through? Mm. Absolutely, I believe in love. You did mention earlier on that I'm also on Mshobo Wenene, in Wotando. In actual fact, tonight we are dealing with yet another tragic story about love. Um, and my hashtag is Mastandanin Dohwan, um, because, you know, uh, we we can spread, we are able to spread more love than disease. It's It's in mm. us. Um, but we need to be mindful on how we teach people. We need to be mindful of what we stand for. Because when you stand for nothing, other people will, will define and, and tell you what to stand for. Um, and, and know that we are interconnected. That concept of Ubuntu, we actually um, supposed to be teaching the world uh, how as African people, we acknowledge and recognize that I am because you are. Uh, but we've allowed ourselves to uh, be isolated. We live in these high walls um, and we are all about self-gratification, me, myself, and I. That is why in our midst we would have someone who gets a tender to deliver services and not deliver those services, instead go and buy 25 Porsche cars. Why? Um, because we are so selfish like that. Um, we need to be conscious and be aware that in our country, uh, this country needs all of us. South Africa is the most beautiful country in the world. And it's, it's upon us to, to make it or break it. And currently we're doing so much breaking it. And I, and, and I hope this message goes to racists as well, um, that you are needed to change your behavior, uh, to abuse us. You know um, your, your weakness. Seek help before you create more damage. Uh, because in that home, when you beat up your partner, your children watch that as a way of resolving problems. Um, mm. You know your weaknesses, seek help. When you are a woman sitting in a loveless environment, learn how to love yourself so that you can build the courage to walk away from a situation that doesn't serve you. And to all of us, find your space. I love the words of Zozibi's Me Too, um, yeah. that you, you need to find your space and occupy it. Occupy. And when you are there, fill up that space. Don't, don't leave room. Um, for, for you to be doubted. When I get into that boardroom as an executive, Chrysalda, who is um, a public figure, ceases to exist because that's not what I'm there to sell. Uh, mm -hmm. When I'm at home as a mom, I give it my all because I don't want when my kids are asked who's your role model, that they must say, um, Smani Bani, who's famous, they must say my mother first, mm -hmm. because indeed I have, they have modeled themselves around me because I'm worthy 
to be modeled. So let's be mindful of these decisions, mindful of um, our role. And I would like, I, I know that my pronunciation of R is, is quite dodgy, but I blame it on my upbringing. <laughs> I was raised by the Basutu people, um, but I, I subscribe by the three R's where you are responsible for the choices you make, uh, where you respect human people and you respect yourself mostly. Um, and it, it's actually respect self, respect others and be responsible for the choices you make at all times. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Crystal de Canada, for coming through. We truly appreciate it here at Change the Voice. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our show for today. But do remember, stop stigmatizing HIV and AIDS. It's, it's normal sickness. Uh, instead, let's support, let's spread love and not disease. All the best for the week and God bless you. Good night. And God bless you. Thank you.